push this down just a little bit. On to today's Archaeological Institute of America National Lecture Program. I am Professor Jeffrey Stevens at the University of Missouri and the president of our local um, AIA Society for Central Missouri here. And I will be um, introducing some things from AIA National. And then I will do another uh, kind of a short um, dynamic with the local society issues. And then we will transfer the introductions to today's speaker. Um, okay, with that. I um, am obligated by the AIA to uh, put forward some of these dynamics. And the AIA is uh, North America's largest and oldest archeological organization with over 200,000 members worldwide. We support archeologists, educators, excavations, publications, research, site preservations, and our programs and publications keep you up to date with archeological discoveries and research from around the world. And you can um, read all about this in our engaging publications like Archaeology Magazine with a readership of over 700,000 per issue and includes in-depth stories, archaeological highlights from around the world and spectacular images that bring the past to vivid life. And if you want more, you can also join in capacities with the American Journal of Archaeology. And this is the world's leading journal of Mediterranean archaeology. Um, we also have a lot of opportunities for practical experience in archaeology through the AIA. And um, you can look on the website to find an excavation uh, for the extensive list of fieldwork opportunities, attend a lecture, an archaeology fair, or other local event organized by the AIA, our local societies, or collaborating organizations, or visit spectacular archaeological sites around the world with AIA tours. And then I encourage all of you to join the AIA and indulge in your passion for archaeology, become a part of the adventure today, uncover the past, experience the thrill of discovery, enjoy exclusive member benefits. And all of this is available on the website, our www.archaeological.org website, where you can join, be a member, find a local society. Uh, there's a new pricing plan that's been put in place over the last couple of years that make it a little bit more diverse in, um, in terms of the choice of membership that you want to engage in. And so I encourage all of you to do that. I also encourage you to support the AIA and make archeology span possible. As a nonprofit, we rely on the generosity of donors to support our mission. Your gift makes archeological research, site preservation and publications, as well as programs possible um, with that. Okay, I'm going to stop screen share real quick on that. And um, now without further ado, I am going to um, get into a, just a real quick dynamic of some local uh, society issues that I do have to make an announcement of, and then we will move on to introduce today's speaker. Um, as president of the Central Missouri Society, um, I've been working at this for a, a while now, trying to deal with all of these COVID situations. And what we are going to do is run a full slate of elections in April. And so my term as president will come to an end in April. And um, we are going to open up all society offer, officer positions for election. And over the next month, I will be um, taking nominations. You can self-nominate. Other people can nominate people that they think would be good with this. I will reach out to those people to verify their interest. And we are going to um, uh, run an entire slate of elections regarding every officer position for the society. I will be nominating my current uh, uh, vice president, uh, Professor Marcello Mojeta for president, but everybody that is a member of our local society can run for every single position. And we will hold those elections online in April. And so if you are interested, if you want to nominate yourself or if somebody has somebody that they want to nominate, please send me the information and we are going to build a robust slate of candidates. And um, in the past, it's been somewhat consistent that a lot of times the secretary treasurer position has often been a good opportunity for a grad student um, to participate in starting to engage with some of these administrative functions of the AIA. And so I encourage grad students to do that. But remember that anybody that is a society member can run for any of these positions, president, vice president, or secretary treasurer. So just email me with interest or with nominations, and we will discuss this over the next month, and we will be holding a full slate of elections in November. So enough on local society stuff. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. 
And today's speaker is Professor John Frey, who's an Associate Professor of Classical Studies at Michigan State University. Um, he received his BA from Ohio State University in Ancient History and Classics, and then both his MA and PhD from UC Berkeley in Ancient History and Mediterranean Archaeology, um, completing his PhD at Berkeley in 2006. He's an associate member of the American School of Classical Studies at Athens. He has areas of specialization that include archaeological reuse, spolia, archaeology and history of later Roman Greece, uh, late Roman and early Christian history, ancient perception and reception of monuments, um, archaeological site mapping, slash GIS, um, and digital archaeology as his areas of specialization. Since 2020, he has um, been the director of the Ohio State um, University Excavations at Ismia, and he advanced to that position after years as associate director and field coordinator uh, for that site as well since um, 2000 six, it looks like actually. And he has also had other field work um, in places in Crete, in Egypt. So he has been in the field fairly consistently, it looks like since about 2001. So that is a lot of field work um, to build up in that. He has a wide array of publications um, in the double digits in various journals and edited volumes, too many for me to recount, but there are um, aspects from Oxford, Brill, Oxbow Press, um, articles in Asperia, um, the American Journal of Archaeology, to name just a few. And then um, last but not least, because I have a little bit of familiarity with this now, um, Professor Frey actually served as the president of the Central Michigan chapter of the AIA for well over a decade, from 2007 to 2018. So I uh, understand some of what he dealt with with that. Now, without further ado, I'm going to um, transfer this over to Professor Frey shortly. What I will say is that we are going to keep everybody on mute throughout the lecture. We encourage you to put questions in the Q&A or the chat for us to process um, at, after the lecture is over and we'll have about a 15 minute Q&A. This is actually um, a pretty large um, a group of people. And so we would prefer to be able to process it at this time through chat. If we feel that we can open it up to um, actual verbal back and forth in the Q&A, we may do that. But for now, if you have questions, start submitting them in chat. Stephen and I will um, look through them and then um, we will turn it over to Professor Frey to choose which ones that he wants to do. So without further ado, um, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, this year's young lecturer, Professor John Frey. Thanks so much, Jeff. Can, can you hear me? Am I, am I coming through okay? All right, let me share screen here and get this thing started. So uh, hopefully now you're looking at the, just confirm for me, we're looking at the Rodney Young um, lecture slide. Is that right? That is what I see. <laughs> Great. Okay. So hi, everybody. Um, I guess I was, I would, in my prepared notes, I was about to say great to be here in Missouri, but uh, great to be here in my office, uh, projecting myself apparently around uh, a, a variety of different places in the States. It's, it's a real joy to be with you this evening. Um, when I was uh, scheduled for this lecture, I found out that I would be the Rodney Young Memorial Lecture, and it's quite an honor, and I thought it might be a good idea to get started just by uh, uh, saying a bit more uh, about uh, 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 Dr. Young. He earned his uh, PhD in Classics and Archaeology at Princeton in 1940, and then immediately headed off to the Mediterranean and participated in a wide variety of, uh, how do you say it, activities uh, during uh, World War II. Uh, driving ambulance, uh, working for the, uh, the Greek Bureau in Cairo, and a variety of different activities of that sort. Uh, he came back to the United States and uh, took up a post as curator of Mediterranean uh, of the Mediterranean section at the UPenn Museum in 1950. Now that was the same year that he opened excavations at Gordion in Turkey, where he would uh, run things until his, his demise in 1974. In 76, to honor uh, his legacy, the, the Philadelphia Society instituted a regular series of lectures that then opened up with a generous gift, opened up in 2001 uh, to a national series. And so it's quite an honor uh, to be uh, this year's uh, Young Memorial Lecture. And I, and I hope I can do right by his uh, uh, legacy with what I'm presenting to you uh, this evening. So, the talk tonight is Archival Archaeology and the Gymnasium Complex at Ismia. So you're looking at a nice sort of 
uh, a legacy photograph here of excavations from 1970 in the area that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun in the chat getting in touch with old Isthmians and Nemeans and Corinthians, but in case you're not familiar with the region, I thought it might be best to kind of start uh, with your sort of general maps uh, to get things started. So uh, Isthmia is located just on the southeastern corner of the land bridge, the Isthmus that connects southern Greece uh, to central and northern Greece. And Isthmia has a kind of unique location. Like the site of Corinth, which oversaw activities at Isthmia, the site of Isthmia is really sandwiched in between two very large bodies of water, uh, the Corinthian Gulf on the west and the Saronic Gulf on the east. And so this is kind of a, a suitable place for the sanctuary of Poseidon because the sea comes very close and kind of hugs the land on either side. Uh, but Isthmia was also important in as much as we suspect that the road that came to uh, the Corinthia and then further on into the Peloponnese from Athens and from Attica passed right through the site uh, before splitting off to the southeast if you wanted to go to Epidaurus or uh, to the southwest if you wanted to head to Corinth and then parts south like uh, Nemea and, and further south from there. And so Ismia kind of held this interesting position as being astride both a sea route because occasionally uh, goods and sometimes even ships were transported across the land bridge uh, from uh, uh, harbor to harbor, uh, but also then the land route that passes from northern Greece into southern Greece. Mythologically speaking, Isthmia has a certain amount of fame for being the home of the god Poseidon, but also being the home of a temple to the local hero Melikertes Palaimon. According to the story, uh, Athamas and Eno uh, the, uh, were a, a couple, the king of uh, Viosha, and uh, Eno actually being the stepmother, uh, right, uh, to Phrixus uh, 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 and Heli, uh, but she was also by uh, um, Athamas, she was the mother to uh, Liarchis and to Melikertes. And because Eno was the sister to Semele, um, when uh, Dionysus was born, uh, the baby was given over for protection uh, to his aunt, to Aunt Eno, and uh, Eno raised the baby. And this earned the ire of Hera, who then uh, sort of exacted her revenge by making uh, Athamas, the father, go mad and seek to destroy his own children. And here he's busy uh, uh, smashing Learchis to bits, while we see in the background uh, Eno jumping off the rocks uh, uh, into the sea with the baby Melikertes. Now at that moment, uh, the gods have mercy on Eno and she transitions into the nymph Lefkothea of Odyssey fame. And Melikertes is carried on the back of a dolphin and reaches the shore just off the coast of Isthmia where he's discovered by Sisyphus. That's yes, yeah, Sisyphus of rock rolling up the hill fame. Uh, the king of Corinth buries the boy Melikertes, who then transitions into uh, uh, the local god Palaimon and institutes the games in honor of Melikertes Palaimon. Now, there's another kind of interesting myth, too, about the founding of the games that's associated with Theseus. Uh, and uh, in his journey from Troezen to claim his birthright in Athens, Theseus sort of spent his way traveling around the Saronic Gulf, kind of cleaning up the area of people who would be dangerous to travelers and uh, to people on the road. And according to the myth, uh, when he reached the area around Isthmus, uh, he encountered Sinus, who had uh, a certain reputation. This is Sinus the pine bender. And Sinus had a reputation of grabbing unsuspecting travelers, bending two pine trees down to the ground in opposite directions, uh, and then tying the traveler to both trees and letting the trees go to apparently for Sinus rather exciting effect. And so Theseus ends up cleaning up the area by subjecting Sinus to his own sort of gruesome form of punishment. In the sixth century BC, Isthmia becomes one of the four major Panhellenic crown game sanctuaries alongside Olympia and Delphi and then also Nemea. So this uh, site becomes famous as a major uh, place for athletic competitions, but also I thought I'd just throw up a couple of these uh, uh, red figure and black figure uh, vessels here, but also at Isthmia because of the location of the theater, uh, we can be quite certain that the games also included recitations of Homer, 
uh, uh, rhapsodic hymns, uh, poetry, things of a performative nature as well as an athletic nature. Now, uh, if you've been to Olympia or to Delphi or to Nemea, uh, you could be forgiven by uh, drawing certain comparisons and uh, drawing your own conclusion that there's just not as much stuff to see at Isthmia. So what we're looking at here in the slide top and bottom on the left is what is left of the enormous temple of Poseidon. Pausanias in his travels tells us that this temple is well worth seeing. We wish we could do what he recommends, uh, but uh, that's as much as we can see anymore. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a view from the southwest and also from the west of what's left of the theater at Isthmia. So there's just not much there. Well, it turns out there is actually a lot there. Uh, it's just most of it was reused in the construction of a Byzantine period, early Byzantine period fortification wall that was designed to house a garrison who was charged with the defense of a wall that spanned the entire isthmus from coast to coast with the intention of protecting southern Greece from land invasion from the north. So the wall has come to be known as the Hexamelian Wall. And in the area of Isthmia, in order to build the fortress, many of the nearby buildings were taken apart and the individual stones used there. So if you stumble around the fortress, if you ever come to visit Isthmia, you'll notice several pieces of stone, as you see in the top right and the bottom left, nice limestone that still shows the fluting of the column drums of the classical period Temple of Poseidon. So significant parts of the sanctuary are actually reused in the walls of the fortification. Now, uh, work began, actually so much of the sanctuary, as it turns out, was uh, uh, sort of disassembled and reassembled into other structures that many scholars, uh, early travelers to the site, had a difficult time even determining where the temple was. Many people felt that the area of the fortress was actually the area of the temple. Now, they were disproven uh, by Oscar Bernier, who in 1952, uh, sank his first trench at Isthmia. He'd come over from his work at Corinth after his work at Amphipoli. Uh, and in his first trench, uh, hit the foundations of the temple and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that this was in fact the sanctuary of Poseidon at Isthmia. You can see him sitting behind a stone that you can still see on the site today with the name of Sisyphus carved right there on the front. Professor Elizabeth Gebhardt uh, uh, at the University of Chicago continues Oscar Bernier's work to this day, uh, and we share uh, a kind of fun relationship with the University of Chicago excavations at Isthmia. Uh, in 1967, Paul Clement with the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, uh, took over uh, certain aspects of exploration at the site. And in 1987, his work was continued by Timothy Gregory at The Ohio State University. So there's kind of a, a really long legacy here that I'm absolutely humbled and honored uh, to participate in uh, as the Ohio State University excavations now transfer into the Michigan State University excavations at Isthmia. Now, because of the work of all of these directors and scholars, the Isthmia Museum actually contains uh, a significant number of very important finds from a wide variety of different periods. I really recommend you come, uh, make it a stop along your, along your travels into the Peloponnese. Uh, lots and lots of things here from Isthmia, but also from nearby places like Cenchreae, uh, the Eastern Harbor uh, of the city of Corinth. Now, because of the work of all of these uh, 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 very accomplished archeologists, we know a couple of things about the instrumental role that Isthmia played in many aspects of Greek culture and Greek history. I'll show you just a couple of examples here. Uh, because of Oscar Bernier's work, um, we've been able to determine that perhaps one of the earliest explorations of Doric style architecture was actually pursued right here on site. And so you're looking at a reconstruction here of the archaic period Temple of Poseidon, both in sort of reconstructed elevation and in reconstructed plan. You see here that uh, Isthmia in the museum boasts an exceptionally large perirentirion, so a nice sort of water basin. Uh, and so here you see it reconstructed both in the museum and in a drawing. Because it was an athletic sanctuary, like the other places where the crown games were celebrated, games came every two years here to Isthmia, uh, and uh, they were quite popular because of the central location of Isthmia right there on the land bridge between northern and southern Greece. Uh, so much so that uh, the old stadium here was eventually abandoned in the Hellenistic period and replaced with an even larger 
uh, area over here that we call the later stadium. But I show you this here in the pictures on the right hand side. One of the more interesting discoveries that Oscar Bernier made in his early excavations at the site was this perplexing device that was eventually worked out and determined to be an early attempt at orchestrating a fair and even start for the foot races uh, that occurred as part of the games. And you can kind of see a reconstruction here of the starting mechanism uh, right there at Ismia. Um, in the Roman period, uh, this is perhaps one of the wet best and most well-preserved monuments we have. In the Roman period, uh, after the resumption of the games at Ismia, uh, this particular structure was built, and this will be important to us tonight. This is the Roman bath at Ismia, which features, as far as we can tell, perhaps the largest example of a bichrome mosaic that you're going to find in the Eastern Mediterranean. The next best examples we have of this are actually in the uh, Hadrianic Baths uh, um, at uh, uh, Ostia. So this is, this is a nice example here. We'll get back to that in just a second. Um, tonight, uh, I hope to be able to add to this uh, impressive record of archaeological work at Ismia by talking about the things that we've been doing lately with legacy data and what we're terming uh, archival archaeology. So uh, archival archaeology is quickly becoming a big thing, uh, especially when things like pandemics keep us all in our offices instead of in the field. We turn a little bit more closely to records, and I think it's important to point out that at ISMI, at least, we've been doing this now for almost two decades, working through uh, the records and the archaeological remains of past excavations in preference to opening up new trenches. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about one example tonight of how we're using archival archaeology to make important new discoveries at the site, not by digging up new soil, but simply by taking a harder look at what already exists in the archives. Now, um, when you think about archival archaeology, you usually think about something like this, you know, quiet work, you know, sitting there poring over records and documents and things like that. And that's absolutely the case. Uh, we've been engaged for about, I don't know, we're coming up on maybe 12, 13 years now of spending our summers digitizing uh, enormous quantities of the UCLA and Ohio State University excavations archives. Uh, and we've been working very hard to put those things up on, in a digital format online so that others can enjoy uh, access in the same way as people who would be able to travel to the site. This has proven really useful uh, during the pandemic, during the lockdown. So we've been able to sort of continue some of our archival archaeological work, even though we weren't able to travel to Greece this past summer. But I'd like to point out that archival archaeology is not just work in an archive. Uh, in many ways, we still spend a great deal of time out in the field. Uh, this involves um, going back into old trenches, cleaning things up, drawing them, uh, using modern technologies like GPS, photogrammetry, drones, different types of things like that, in an effort to try and make sense of records of trenches that were excavated in the 1960s and 1970s. And then you can see in the picture on the right, we don't ever miss the opportunity to also use these trenches once they've been cleaned as a teaching moment for students, you know, to learn how to engage in proper uh, archaeological documentation of trenches and of archaeological finds. So in some ways, right, uh, arche arch archival archaeology for us is both work on paper, but also very much still work in the field. It's just that we're not opening new trenches. So, uh, that's sort of the nice background. I hopefully, hopefully we're, we're all on the same page here. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is turn to the area that we refer to as the lower sanctuary. Uh, the contour lines in the picture on the right don't necessarily show it all that well, uh, but it does slope down quite noticeably from the plateau on which the temple and what we call the East Field and the earlier stadium sit down toward the area of the bath and the courtyard of the theater. What you're looking at on the left hand side of this slide is the state plan uh, for the Roman bath, which was uh, excavated first uh, by Oscar Bernier underneath uh, what eventually became this big tree. He sunk a trench there in 1954 and determined to his satisfaction that we had a Roman bath and then moved on. Uh, Paul Clement in 1970 began excavating north of the Roman bath and then in 1972 to 1978 cleared just about all that we see here today. This was followed by uh, excavations in the 1980s and 1990s. I see Richard Roth, this is just shown, uh, or at some point has shown up uh, in this talk. So I've got to give a shout out to Richard, 
who oversaw uh, some of these excavations that occurred along the south side uh, and in different places, especially under uh, the mosaic floor of the bath. We'll get to that in just a second. Um, and so uh, what we're looking at here are some shots from the 1970s as the bath was slowly revealed uh, to the archaeologists uh, um, uh, as they went, as they progressed essentially from north to south uh, uh, through the whole entire complex, revealing the, the bichromatic mosaic. Uh, one of the things I want to point out to you here is the way in which this area, you can see right here where the figural mosaic is in the middle, you can see it running uh, in this line along the side of the patterned panels just to the right of the figural uh, mosaic. Uh, and then here, this individual is standing in this divot. The, the mosaic floor of room six of the bath had been significantly damaged by the collapse of the vaulted ceiling of the bath. Uh, and so fairly early on in the 1980s, it was determined that what needed to happen was that the bath, uh, that the floor of room six needed to be lifted and preserved and then reset so we'll get to that in just a second. In 1978, excavations had made it all the way down to the southern part of the bath, and that's where archaeologists began to encounter some curious features here uh, in the location of room eight. Uh, what they found were these large uh, limestone blocks with basins with waterproof cement on the inside. Uh, excavations beneath the floor of room eight which at some point in antiquity had lost whatever floor it had once had, thus rendering this area safe for excavation, began to reveal a depressed area here, but the walls and the floor of which were covered in waterproof uh, cement. Uh, further excavations, certainly uh, the ones that were conducted once the bath floor uh, of room six were lifted, was lifted in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, this produced uh, evidence uh, that, that finally sort of got us to where we understand what's going on. There is, beneath the floor of the Roman bath, an earlier, most likely Hellenistic period, uh, Greek pool. This thing is huge. It measures close to 30 meters, or as Timothy Gregory has argued, about 100 Greek feet on a side. It's about a meter and a half deep. And by our estimates, it could hold somewhere close to 1,200 cubic meters or over 300,000 gallons of water. That's about half the size of a modern day Olympic sized swimming pool. So this is a very, very large pool, very deep pool. Uh, it's orders of magnitude larger than the pools that are available to us, for example, at Delphi or at Olympia. Another interesting feature that I think is important to point out is if you pay attention to the southern part of the Roman bath, you'll see that the blue line here, which is marking out the location of the Greek pool, is slightly off center. It's off orientation from that of the Roman bath, about four degrees, as it turns out. Uh, we'll get back to that in just a second. So this is what we've reconstructed the Greek pool to look like. As much as we can tell, there are the basins along a water channel, perhaps settling basins for delivery of water into the pool, or perhaps basins to be used to wash yourself off before you get into the pool or something like that. We began, uh, uh, you know, as, as uh, uh, when, when Timothy Gregory sort of took over from Paul Clement, he inherited the publication project of the bath. And as part of that, uh, we've been sort of reinvestigating a lot of the trenches and trying to come to a better understanding of what's going on in all of the different areas and phases of the bath. And in the time that I became active at Ismia, we began to look north of the area that we had originally assumed was the sort of furthest extent of the Roman bath. Um, we've been looking at this area up here. Uh, you can see in this sort of weird trapezoidal shaped area, this was excavated in the 1970s on the assumption that it represented some sort of fortlet or a little bastion that overlooked the deep ravine off to the northwest. So you can see that the hexamelion comes through this sort of uh, Byzantine trans Isthmian fortification wall comes to the corner of the Roman bath and then moves up and actually incorporates the Roman bath for a certain amount of its span before heading north and then eventually off to the east. So it was a reasonable assumption that the fortification walls would have formed like a fortlet or something like that. But no sooner did they start opening trenches than they became quite confused at certain features. One of the ones that we opted to reinvestigate in the early 2000s was a trench sunk in 1970. This trench is particularly interesting 
uh, in that not much discussion was made of what we were seeing in the floor of the trench when we had finally cleaned all of the debris and pine needles and uh, collapsed uh, scarp uh, from the bottom of the trench. What we found, and you can see it here in the bottom uh, plan view of this uh, drawing of the trench, you can see that there's a series of four ashlar blocks that actually share a pair of parallel setting lines. And oddly enough, uh, those setting lines are again off axis of the wall that sits above it. And that's particularly interesting to us. Another interesting thing we saw has to do with this particular ashlar stone right here. It seems to be off orientation from the other ashlars in this wall. Uh, you can see it here in the elevation drawing of the trench. Uh, it's more likely that this block would have sat in a horizontal position further up on the wall, but at some point it's been rotated to uh, sort of take a more vertical orientation and set in place here alongside and over the top of smaller stones right here to the left and right. And it didn't take us too long to look to other parts of the bath to realize that that technique seems to be used throughout the construction of the Roman bath, which dates sometime to around the second century AD. So what we're fairly certain we have here is a wall that dates to an earlier building that was then at the time of the construction of the Roman bath remodeled and somehow put back into use or extended. Reinvestigation of this trench also showed us uh, what archaeologists have known for a long time revealed again to us that this little margin right here that sits between this earlier wall and the 5th century AD fortifications of the Hexamillion conceals a doorway. This is actually a filled doorway. This block right here at the top you see is actually a lintel block over a door that measures something about one meter wide and about two meters tall. That very much got our interest. And so we started cleaning off the tops of the walls that had been revealed in the 1970s. And what we found were a series of what you would refer to as sort of swallowtail or bow tie clamps. These are clamps that would have held these ashlar blocks into place uh, in their original uh, uh, use. And the more we cleaned, uh, the more we found. Uh, and these bow tie clamps actually are still holding blocks together in their original place of use. Uh, also interesting to us was the uncovering, once we cleaned all the soil and debris off the top of the original area here, we discovered that this block was actually anchored into a wall that ran north-south. So this east-west wall right here at this point is actually tied into a north-south wall that as it turns out, not too surprisingly, lines up very, very well with the east wall of the Roman bath. And so what we're reconstructing here is something like a room that measures about 11 meters north-south by about six and a half meters east-west. It would appear that in the 1970s, the archeologists had the same idea, although they were tracing it from the south and were trying to figure out how far the wall of the east wall of the Roman bath went. They were trying to discover a room in this location to the south of the room that we're reconstructing. Their trench produced results that left them quite disappointed, but our reinvestigation of this trench has shown us that actually uh, there probably was a wall there. It's kind of hard to tell, so I threw in a little sort of blue line here to help you see it, but there's a reddish soil down below and up above is a slightly sort of lighter color, a beigeish soil that contains enormous quantities of broken debris. What we think actually happened here is that the original wall that lined the eastern side of this room we're reconstructing was completely robbed out and, and used for stone that was then placed into the backside of the hexamillion, the fortification wall, in order to augment its thickness. And so what ends up happening then is you're left with a ditch once you pull all the stones out, and then soil is simply dumped back into the ditch in order to level out the surface of the ground inside the wall. And so we're almost certain that there probably would have been a corner here and a wall here. But then as we looked around a bit more, uh, it, it also caught our attention that this clamp here, this is that lintel block that you see above the doorway, that it is clamped to a smaller stone that's been roughly broken away on its western side. That got us thinking uh, that uh, perhaps the wall continues on to the west. 
Again, this area had been excavated in the 1970s, so we simply cleared the debris out and discovered that the archaeologists simply weren't uh, sufficiently observant. Uh, and uh, what ended up happening is, is they missed the part where the ashlar stones actually project out at lower depths uh, from this area of the lintel and the doorway. So then we started to ask, well, if it goes east, where is the return for this wall? Uh, and it only took us a few minutes of looking over the original plans, the state plans, the archaeologist drawings of the original 1970s excavations, and we realized that they had, in fact, unknowingly uncovered what is probably the northwest corner of yet another room. So uh, we quickly ran out into the field uh, and began cleaning out this trench as well. I was almost certain, uh, I, I, was, I was almost certain, because here is a ravine, uh, and here is a nice uh, square room, uh, and the water flows from the south to the north in this location, uh, you never would have thought that uh, you'd have found somebody happier uh, at the possibility of finding a bathroom in Greece. I, I was anxious to, uh, to prove that this was a latrine. Uh, it seemed like a reasonable conclusion given its proximal location to the bath and its location by the ravine. Uh, but uh, we went and as soon as we began cleaning out the old trenches, we realized that this simply could not have been the case. That's because this section right here is actually a furnace. What you're looking at here is a, is a badly scarred and fractured uh, stone floor that then steps down again to another stone floor that's covered in lots of fine sort of silty black soot. Uh, and what we probably have here then is a furnace that feeds off the west side into the northwest corner of this room right here. Interestingly enough, apparently the furnace worked a little too well because this area right here is an enormous bank of mud that was put into the, the area of the furnace, perhaps uh, in order to close off the area for burning to reduce the size of the furnace. Uh, perhaps the, the burn was too efficient and was producing too much heat for the room. I show you here just a couple of pictures. This is the uh, uh, mud bank that was placed inside the furnace. Uh, and here we're actually looking on the picture on the right, we're actually looking at the sort of darker sort of silty black soil that lines the bottom of this room on the inside. Now, the other interesting thing that we found in this bank of mud was a series of interesting tiles that look like this. This, as it turns out, it took a little bit of, uh, of, of research, but as it turns out, these are known as teguli mamatai. These are uh, 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 breast tiles. Uh, and a fully formed breast tile looks something like this. Uh, it's basically the size of a Roman uh, uh, floor tile, but it has four projecting cones on the corners. Uh, and as it turns out, this is a style of bath, of heating the walls of a Roman bath with a hypocaust system that seems to have been abandoned around the time of the first century AD. So one of the things that's kind of interesting here is we're kind of putting these things together now. Uh, if you'll remember, um, Corinth uh, oversaw the activities, the athletic festivals, the activities that occurred at Isthmia. Uh, we know that Corinth was sacked in the middle of the second century BC by the Romans and the city was largely uh, uh, left without its civic status until it was refounded as a, as a Roman colony in the middle of the, sec uh, middle of the first century BC. We expect that Isthmia likewise was abandoned during that time. Uh, but when the Romans come back to Corinth, we can be fairly certain that they refounded uh, the Isthmian Games. And we think from about the middle of the first century BC to the middle of the first century AD, the revived Isthmian Games actually took place at Corinth. But then in the middle of the first century AD, those games came back to Isthmia. And it's quite likely, uh, Timothy Gregory has argued, and we've argued this together, it's quite likely that at that point, uh, the Greek pool was dusted off and put back into action. But I'd like to suggest that what's probably happening up toward the north here is, is that the Romans have gotten way too used to their style of heated bathing and want some type of feature to augment the use of the Greek pool. Therefore, these rooms, a heated room, certainly on the left, we're not entirely sure of what the function of the room here is on the right. Uh, but these rooms then were added to the complex with the Greek pool 
And it's quite likely then that we've had the orient that the, the chronological order of things backwards, uh, that it's not these rooms that follow the orientation of the second century AD Roman bath, but in fact, these rooms of first century AD date are the ones that dictate the odd orientation of the Roman bath with respect to the Greek pool. What are these buildings to the north? Well, certainly we have a heated hypocaust room to the left. Uh, we're not entirely sure of the room to the right, but you know, it's tempting to suggest, especially the early sort of uh, date of this bathing establishment, that perhaps we have something like a separate bathing establishment for women. To that, we might point to this little inscription that runs across the wall right here. It's a graffito that's been carved into the surface of the Ashlar wall uh, that says that the, uh, you know, to the beautiful women of Mytilene, uh, or something along those lines, uh, a rough translation of, of, the, of the Greek graffito. And so, you know, maybe, maybe some wishful thinking, but maybe there's something that has to do with a, a separate bathing facility uh, for women to the north. Let me turn to a different place uh, and uh, talk to you a bit more about uh, some excavations that we reinvestigated in the early 2000s. We're going to look up here uh, to this odd complex of walls just to the northeast of the Roman bath, of the second century AD Roman bath. This area was actually excavated. You see this big, long, narrow trench right here was actually excavated by British archaeologists Jenkins and McGaw in 1930s. They published it in 1932. And for them, this was a textbook example of a Roman style, of a Byzantine style fortification. For them, they saw this large wall here, uh, and they referred to, in, and in sort of customary fortification strategy, this is the tijos, this is the main wall. Then they encountered a small wall to the front, and for them, this was the protihisma, the, the short wall in front of the main wall. And as the terrain falls off to the north, they thought, well, certainly that must represent the ditch, the tafros that comes out in front. Interestingly enough, when uh, the archaeologists under Paul Clement at UCLA uh, got a hold of the trend, got a hold of this area, they excavated some trenches in 1970 and 1972, and discovered some features that didn't necessarily agree with that interpretation. For example, they encountered a number of north-south running walls that tied together the two east-west running walls. Uh, perhaps more interesting for us, uh, they encountered uh, gaps in the wall that were roughly occasionally filled with stones. You see a molded cornice here, and then quite often several centimeters of clay and soil at the bottom. This just did not seem to fit with, a, with a, any type of sort of uh, well-planned out defensive strategy for defending uh, uh, this, all of southern Greece with this wall. So uh, they kind of left it at that, scratched their heads and moved on. We've gone back and reinvestigated. And what we've discovered is that there is actually a repeating pattern here. There's a north-south wall and a gap that's been filled in. Again, a north-south wall and another filled in gap. You see that one right here. You see the mortar and the small stones as compared to the clamped larger ashlars here to the left and right. And that pattern repeats over and over again, so that it's probably more likely that this is not originally a fortification facing north, but in fact, as Timothy Gregory argued, more likely some type of multi-roomed building facing south. Uh, and that what happens is that in the time of the fortification of Greece in the fifth century AD, the, uh, the northern parts of these walls are demolished, the stones are used to bolster up the backside of this wall right here, and the thing is converted into a fortification wall. It tends to account for all of the oddities that the archaeologists in the 70s couldn't explain. So we started poking around in different areas here and here and here and here, and we encountered a wide variety of Doric style architecture. All of these architectural fragments were recognized for a long time as being of the same architectural module which means that they're supposed to go together. Uh, so we started drawing and sketching and measuring these. And we came to discover that, yeah, you could generally reconstruct the look of the colonnade of this building. If you'll notice that these pieces are quite often, they quite often feature one half triglyph and then a full triglyph and then a hacked up broken part in uh, here to the other side. And we're reconstructing the idea that it's quite likely that these are in fact three metapede 
epistyle freeze blocks that are roughly hacked in half in order to make them easier to transport to use in the Byzantine fortification. So if reconstructed correctly, and with Paul Scotton's help, I have to give him a, a shout out of thanks for this, uh, we're able to reconstruct a colonnade that would be something close to four and a three quarters meters tall with an intercolumniation of about two and a half meters. Another interesting discovery just by looking again at these trenches has to do with this particular column right here. Uh, if you catch it in the sunlight just right, you will notice that there is actually etched into the top of this stone, the Roman numeral 21. And so this has allowed us to suggest that uh, unless, unless someone's having fun and just writing the number 21 on a number of column capitals in places that you wouldn't have seen, uh, this must have something to do with the ordering of the colonnade that came in front of these rooms. And so we've reconstructed a building that must be at least 50 meters long. So we're, we're considering this as a, a colonnade with perhaps a stoa-like structure uh, to the north of it. We continue to look in different places and we continue to find other bits and pieces of Doric architecture that match that module. So for example, here is an unfluted Doric style column. Here is a Doric style cornice. Uh, we keep finding them all over the place. Uh, and so uh, that cornice we found all the way over here where the orange dot is. The column, I think columns are blue. So the blue dot right here, the capital we found right here. All of these pieces are of the same uh, module, the same dimensions as pieces we've been finding all along the length of this wall. So at this point, uh, we were fairly convinced that we must have some type of stoa-like structure uh, along the north side of the lower sanctuary. Uh, all we needed to do uh, was find the uh, foundations uh, of the colonnade. And unfortunately, I have proved uh, uh, that has proved more difficult, uh, easier said than done. Um, there's a couple of problems here. Uh, what you're looking at in this black and white photograph is a photograph that's taken from uh, east to west, looking at the mound of earth that represents the fortification wall in its decayed state. You can see that the back wall of our stoa-like building would proceed in this direction all the way over to uh, a spot that's about seven meters in front of this wall. The problem is that in this location, if you go about seven meters in front of this wall right here, you're hanging out way over a gully, which would have required an immense amount of foundations, which almost certainly should still show up for us, but do not. So the idea here may be that there is a series of rooms along the backside of this building that end at some point, but the irregularities are masked by a continuous colonnade that stretches along the full width of uh, this area of the site. So all we needed to do was find the foundations for that front colonnade. And I'm, unfortunately, I cannot produce that. Uh, we went back and looked at 1970s trenches right here where the archaeologists must have had the same exact idea and found no traces of any foundations whatsoever. Uh, this continues to vex me. I have lots and lots of architecture for a colonnade. I do not know where on earth to put the colonnade. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is often a problem in, in architectural history, right? Uh, what we did find though, maybe it's a consolation prize, I don't know. What we did find in cleaning out these trenches from the 1970s were a whole series of stamped terracotta tiles. These are roof tiles. And uh, when you drop a roof tile on the ground, it smashes up into a whole bunch of pieces. And most of the pieces you don't necessarily recognize as being particularly interesting, but some of the pieces, ideally probably the ones right toward the middle of these large tiles actually contain stamps that are sort of fired into the tile, either to make them property of the site, you can see a little dolphin here, so perhaps property of Poseidon, or, or to mark uh, the, the factory or the shop from which it came or the person who sponsored the project or something along those lines. Very, very similarly shaped tiles have been found at several places around the site, most notably, uh, in the area that was published by Betsy Gebhard, uh, the theater courtyard here. So the area sort of behind the scene building of the theater produced. This is actually from her publication of the theater. Here is an inventory card showing that we're finding very, very similarly stamped tiles in the area here as we find in the area of the theater. This sort of search for interesting chunks of terracotta was uh, further 
uh, sort of uh, 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 fanned, this, this sort of uh, desire to go find other pieces. Uh, the, the flames were fanned by the discovery in the process of cleaning out this 1978 trench, the discovery of this terracotta piece you see right here. So this is Teresa holding it up the moment she pulled it. It had eroded out of the wall of the scarp, so we merely needed to pick it up off of the bottom of the trench floor as we cleaned it. Here it is, made it up with another piece that was found in the same, uh, on the bottom of the trench in the same place. Uh, and uh, what we think we have here is finally the largest piece that made it recognizable. We seem to have a piece of a cyma. Uh, I'll get to this in a second. Uh, as soon as we found that, we immediately started to raid all of the storage facilities around the OSU UCLA excavation house. Uh, this meant pulling out tons and tons of boxes, searching through and sorting. And what we found were a number of pieces of terracotta cyma that over the years, because the pieces were occasionally so small, had been misidentified as terracotta plaques, as antifixes, as decorative pilasters, different types of things like that. But then now we're able to actually put all of these different pieces uh, you know, virtually together and in some ways finally confirm what Janie Reinhardt had suggested in her dissertation in the early 2000s, uh, that what we're looking at are stamped or sort of mold made terracotta cyma pieces. Now here's a, at least to me, a kind of fascinating and fun story. No sooner had we started to sort of put these different drawings together and say, look, what we have here is an acanthus with vine tendrils, right, and an egg and dart motif across the top. We started to think about that. And we, and you know, what a cyma essentially is, is a gutter. It's the end of a series of terracotta roof tiles that lines the top of a building. So you see a Doric style cornice here, uh, the triglyphs and metopes of the frieze course, the epistyle and the columns. So this thing exists all the way up at the top, but you can't have a gutter without having downspouts. And so no sooner had we been sitting around and saying, well, almost certainly then at some point we should find a lion's head water spout. Almost the exact moment that we all started saying that to each other, a student proudly came up from the storage room down below and said, look what I found. And there it is. It is the mane and ear with the ear hole and the egg and dart motif of a lion's head water spout that matches the same exact dimensions as the terracotta cyma pieces we found elsewhere. Oddly enough, the closest parallel for this is over in Corinth. Uh, these are pages out of Ron Stroud and Nancy Bukidi's publication of the Stoa and the Demeter and Kore Sanctuary on the north slopes of Acrocorinth. And here, in a building they're dating to about the second century AD, you see very similar tendril curls, egg and dart motif, and lion's head water spouts. The last bit I'll show you uh, has to do with the digital work that we're doing as part of the archival archaeology uh, project we've been engaged in. I showed you a picture of doing the GPS stuff in the field before. One of the interesting things about Isthmia is that while we have overall site plans, we don't have them in digital format that allows them to be zoomed in and out on. And what, what typically happened was Archaeologists dug in different parts of the site and produced their own unique state plans for those different places uh, at the site. And this is very much a case of sort of like the old, the old story about the blind men and the elephant. Uh, in some ways, each archaeologist was very, very closely fixated on their own individual parts of the site. And we've been able to take a step back to link up all of these drawings and to realize that there's probably larger patterns at play that have simply gone unrecognized. Uh, and so I'll show you here. This is a drone image of the west wall of the fortification. Uh, here is a false aerial image built up from a uh, photogrammetric uh, uh, orthophoto mosaic. So these are photographs taken at ground level, but then sort of tilted up in a 3D model so as to produce a false aerial image. And what you're looking at here is the corner uh, of a set of stairs. You see three steps right here, and then we have walls running off to the north. In the 1960s, the UCLA archaeologists actually traced this at different spots, going all the way up to a place where the walls take off in an east-west direction. So you can kind of see the little trenches here and there where, these, where this wall was traced. Uh, the archaeologists refer to it as the long walls. And in his publication of the Hexamillion and Fortress, Timothy Gregory suggested 
that we were looking at some earlier building on a slightly different orientation. So what we've done in the end is we've stitched together all of these different sort of archival explorations and we're suggesting uh, that on the basis of a lot of shared architectural fragments all around four sides of this courtyard, as well as a number of aligned walls, notice the odd trapezoidal shape of the courtyard that backs the scene building of the theater. It seems a little bit odd that it's not rectilinear or, or that it's rectangular, uh, but we suspect that what's going on here is, is there's an attempt to align the north wall of the theater courtyard with the wall that was heading in an east-west direction over toward the bath. Uh, it's a bit more speculative, but I would point out to you the other kind of interesting thing is that most theaters, as you may well know, are essentially big stone funnels. Uh, and uh, when it rains, you've got to find some way to get rid of all of the rainwater, otherwise it pools here in the orchestra and scene building. And so the theater at Ismia has an enormous drain that sits underneath this wall right here to the north of the caveat and the scene building. This drain uh, uh, was only explored for a small distance and it kind of heads off in the direction that is indicated by the arrow. In the 1950s, Oscar Bernier excavated this area over here that's referred to as the North Drain. And it is also an exceptionally large waterway that takes water from above, shoots at a 90 degree angle out to the north and throws the water out north over the ravine. Um, we're kind of being a bit speculative here, but it certainly seems to be the case that these two things uh, are more likely connected than not. Uh, and we're making the argument that there doesn't seem to be a good reason why you wouldn't just drain the theater out into this field unless you're hoping to keep this field nice and dry. Uh, and uh, in, in moments of greater speculation, uh, uh, occasionally I will comb through Google Earth images and catch this orange grove at different times of the year. And I swear I can see that these trees aren't growing as well uh, along this line between the theater drain and the north drain. But uh, I, I tried to pitch that to a student recently and got a kind of cockeyed look like, uh, like she thought I was a, a bit crazy. So I'll, I'll back off of that one. Uh, but the other one I want to point out to you is this. Timothy Gregory a long time ago pointed out that from this jog in the wall right here to the part where it joins up with a fortress is about 180 meters long. And if you're familiar with Greek uh, athletics at all, you would know that that's roughly the length of one Greek stade, the length of a stadium. And that allows us to draw really interesting comparisons with the other Panhellenic Greek sanctuaries. So for example, at Delphi, we have a bath structure that is tied to a running track that is one stayed long, that is half covered and half uncovered. Perhaps even more interestingly, at Olympia, most of this has now been wiped out by the river, uh, but the German archaeologists early on published a series of colonnaded uh, halls that extend off to the north side of their palaestra structure. If you turn that a quarter turn clockwise, you get something that is very strikingly similar to what we have at Isthmia. I'll stop there because I've already gone a bit longer than I'd hoped to, uh, but I would point out to you that uh, one of the other interesting things is to go read Vit Vitruvius's recommendation for how to build a, a, an open courtyard, how to build a gymnasium structure. And it's quite amazing how closely what we're reconstructing here at Isthmia matches Vitruvius's recommendations. In closing, I just want to uh, uh, give a shout out and, and just express my extreme gratitude for all of the directors and all of the archaeologists who have uh, 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 guided me in my work and who have uh, kept such careful and good records that are allowing us to do this type of archival archaeology. Uh, uh, Betsy Gebhardt and Timothy Gregory, to be sure. Uh, but also to give a shout out to the years and years and years of study abroad students who have cleaned holes, who have uh, uh, you know, drawn stratigraphy, who have uh, uh, just sort of labored out there wondering why we're continuing to weed things over and over and over again. Uh, and so I just want to express my appreciation for all their hard effort uh, that's produced these kind of fun results. And with that, I think I'll stop and maybe turn things over. Uh, to Jeff, or maybe we can kind of call on people together or something like that. Um, so thank you very much. 
Well, uh, thank you so much, Professor Frey. That was a wonderful talk. And as I'm uh, prone to do in these, now that we are virtual, had we been in our normal hall where we hold this, I'm sure that you would have received a very, very kind of a boisterous uh, round of applause. <laughs> um, so we will basically do the Zoom um, version. Yeah, of that. yeah, yeah, sure. The, uh... It was a wonderful um, a talk. And um, we do have a few minutes for questions. So I'm not going to take up much time of this. And um, if I'll leave you as the co-host, you should still have that function, but you can see both. There is a question sitting in Q&A. There is a question sitting in chat, I believe. And so right. you can fill those as you see fit and um, kind of process those. But do everybody that wants to submit a question do for now, please put them through either the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen or the chat for this time. And I will let Professor Frey um, continue to process those. So I see a question here about how water got to the pool. Yeah, 300,000 gallons is a, is a lot of water. And so how exactly is that getting to the pool? And to be quite honest with you, we're not in, in completely and entirely sure. Uh, let me go back here to a, a plan of the site, an overall plan here, perhaps. Uh, no, not that. So as best we can tell, if you're able to see in this slide, there's these sort of odd lines right here. There are a number of water channels that wrap all around the Temple Temenos of Poseidon. We assume lots of fountains and flowing water and things that Poseidon would have found very exciting. Uh, but then there is actually a large cistern and a number of underground channels that seem to tap into a major aquifer here to the west and slightly to the north of the temple. Uh, and the best, the best guess we have is that water would have passed down either through terracotta conduits. Uh, I think Tim Gregory has suggested perhaps something less permanent, perhaps a water, uh, a water channel made out of wood. Uh, things we just don't have access to. But certainly, it would seem that the source of water uh, is coming from the western area of the Temple Temenos and would have been funneled somehow downhill toward the bath. And then one assumes when the bath is flushed, then flushed out into the ravine further off to the north. That's essentially as, as well as we can do uh, at present. Um, Jeff, I, you said there's a question in... I saw one in the Q and A. Um, I'm not seeing any more in the chat. So please, if anybody has any questions, um, do please submit them in either place. I do see um, Jennifer raising a hand. Um, so if we could look at that question. Um, sure. It, do we have the ability to let Jen just say her thing? Is that a, is that a, is that a thing we can do? Um, um, maybe I can. I, we'll see if I'm still screen sharing. I'm not, oh, there's there's it. Let's see, attendees. Let's see, Jen. I'm, I'm coming, Jen. Hold on. Uh, here, allow the talk. Jen, you're up. Are you still muted? Okay, maybe I'll. Maybe I'll. I, I'm. I'm slightly nervous to do this, but uh, Richard, <laughs> you're on, Richard. I, uh, I actually just uh, raised my hand by accident, uh, old man using Zoom. So <laughs> You're going to do that to me, are you? You're going to make me nervous that you're going to disprove everything. And then you're but, uh, gonna... but, but I will, uh, but I will ask you a question, um, which is an appropriate question. What, um, so what next, um, other than the never ending search for the foundation north of the bath, um, what's, what's next? Uh, right. So uh, at this point, uh, the, the real goal, Richard, is, uh, as you know, is, is to get the is to, is to just finally say enough. We've we we we've got to get the bath publication done. I mean, I, there's so much that intrigues me about what's going on to the north of the bath, so much that intrigues me about what's going on to the south. Uh, but at this point, it's 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 something we, we just have to publish. Uh, so right now it's it's processing all of the stuff from the 70s, 80s, and 90s excavations and getting that out. Um, the thing that continues to really trouble me, I can't, and it's something that Tim's talked about. It's something that Betsy talks about a lot. It's it has to do with the routes of passage through the site. Um, you know, how do you get? You know, the northeast gate here in this picture, you know, as you know, is based on a first century AD triple bay Roman arch, which must mark the sort of ceremonial entrance to the site in the in the Roman period. So so 
the roadway through Isthmia must begin here. But at that point, where does it go? And if I've reconstructed, if Tim and I have reconstructed a, a colonnaded courtyard here, then that just cut off one of the major routes that had always been suspected, a major route of passage west to east to west through the site. So I don't know. How do you get from what east to west through Isthmia to get onto your way to, to Corinth? And it's it's perplexing. Uh, and so we're we're not that that would be my next thing. That's what I'm anxious to do. So Okay, uh, John, there are a couple more questions that came in. So if you look at the Q&A, there are two more questions sitting there in that queue. <laughs> but Don, Don already knows the answer to that question. 1995, right, Don? <laughs> Did I get it right? I hope I got it right. So that was, yeah, I, 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 I think I got, yes. So Don, Don got me, yes. Uh, the, the year that we all sat there in the hot sun and chiseled mosaic uh, uh, tesserae out, of a, of a reconstructed uh, uh, bath mosaic. So Phyllis wants to know, did the bath complex serve only the festival events and participants or are there suspected residential structures in the vicinity? Is there a hostel? I am really, really anxious to see what Eric Paler and uh, Stephen Ellis uh, have done with the work originally started by Paul Clement and continued by Richard Rothis in the East Field over here. Um, that's our closest bet for some type of residential structure. Um, certainly there would be caretakers for the site. Um, it's, it's a bit speculative on my part, but I'm imagining something like the way in which we, uh, you even still today, go visit famous ballparks, even when a game's not being played. Uh, and so may, maybe that maybe parts of the sanctuary are left open and functioning throughout. Certainly sacrifices to Poseidon and to Palaiman Melikertes would have continued throughout. Uh, so does the bath function throughout? I'm not entirely sure, but uh, I'd like to think so. Um, yes, there are lunate sigmas uh, on on some of those tile stamps. Um, I, you know, it's really it, it's another one of these sort of interesting aspects of the legacy of the dig. Uh, uh, Professor Michael Mills had been given the job of studying these and had done a, a phenomenal job in accumulating all of the evidence for stamped tiles, uh, but unfortunately has, has uh, recently passed away and has passed on his archives. So we're beginning to sort of reprocess all of the evidence for the stamped tiles. And so that's a project that, that I'm not terribly familiar with, but I'm gonna need to get up to speed on quite soon. So I, I, at some point, I hope to have an answer for you. Um, real quick, John, can you, someone's asking if you could read the questions out. They, they apparently can't see all the questions. So oh, so, so I was asked, are the tile stamps with lunar sigmas? Are they rather late? Uh, I, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I think what we're doing, uh, I think the only sort of, at this point, the only sort of published record of uh, the published discussion of the tiles uh, is, is Betsy Gebhardt's publication of the theater. And she puts it into a later second century AD phase where they're trying to reconstruct parts of the theater. Other questions? I think there was a raised hand. Am I, is it Ulrika? Am, am I allowed to? Yeah, so yeah, if we can. I don't know if there's, a, is that a, yeah, here. So I'll just allow you to talk if possible. How about now? Wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I'm so glad you can hear me. Sorry. I thought I submitted my question in the Q&A, but I, I lost it. Um, I have also been, first of all, thank you so much for a great presentation. Mm -hmm. Second, um, as someone who's also been working with legacy data, I'm curious as to the centralized are your historical records of these excavations that you are now revisiting, are they all centralized at Isthmia or are you having to go to different institutions? And then the second part of the question is, have you already gotten a sense of how much there is that hasn't been worked up yet? These are questions that I'm facing myself right now. And so I'm curious to hear your answer. Yeah, um, so the, the records, uh, just because of the, the history of the excavation, the records that uh, uh, are associated with Oscar Bernier's excavations and then Betsy Gebhardt's excavations are kept at the Isthmian Museum. Uh, and then the uh, records associated with Paul Clement and Timothy Gregory's work are kept at, at the, uh, the place affectionately called the Dig House. 
Uh, and so those things are a two minute walk away from each other. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, we're fortunate to have them all kind of centrally located. We've been trying to digitize and provide those things via the internet so that, for example, in times like the pandemic or for people who simply wanna check a quick note or something like that, that they can go to a sort of centrally located place online and find access to those, uh, to those records. So uh, that's, that's what we're working on. We can continue to work on. It's, it is definitely a shoestring budget type of operation. So we scan when we can and we put it up when, when we have those sort of files prepared. Um, what other things are out there? Uh, certainly more work, at least for me, more work in the fortress. Um, I, I think there's much, much more to be said about the walls that underlie the fortress walls, about uh, different areas of use of the fortress uh, and different periods of use. One of the things that I'm uh, uh, really fascinated about is the way in which Ismia gives us a snapshot of what happens in the moments after a, a big impressive fortification is done. So if this fortification is built in the in the fifth century AD, you know, what does it look like in the 10th? What does it look like in the 13th? You know, we have a number of domestic structures that are built up against both inner and outer faces of the fortification wall. And so, you know, I'm interested in that kind of medieval, that sort of late medieval and early modern period at Ismia, and, and maybe having a conversation about the afterlives of, of Byzantine style fortifications. I, I, I find that really interesting. And so uh, hopefully, hopefully others will too and will want to work on that with me. Uh, real quick, John, there are some things coming in additionally on the Q&A. There are a couple things on chat and on chat, um, there's somebody asking about what the mosaic may have represented. And then there was another comment on, um, has anyone tested the runner start strings? Um, and how does the prevent cheating or false starts and some of that running dynamic that you were alluding to? So if you could just hit those and then you can go back to the Q&A. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so the, uh, wait, what was the one before the running track? What was the mosaic representing? Um, you know, but I'm not sure exactly which mosaic, so. Uh, so, so Janie Reinhardt uh, uh, has just done a phenomenal job uh, of picking up on, on uh, uh, Pamela Packard's work and talking about the, the bichromatic mosaic. Uh, and it's, it might, if it's possible, she, she does just an amazing job of talking about all of the interpretive possibilities. So what you seem to have are, uh, what do you call them, ichthyocentaurs, right? So part centaur, part sea creature or something like this. Uh, and then you have this little uh, Cupid style figure here riding on the back of the dolphin, lots of examples of sea creatures. The interpretive possibilities are amazing here. Um, certainly we're bringing up ideas of myriads, uh, of uh, you know, sea creatures and things like that. Certainly Thetis being one of the more famous Nereids, we may have a reference here to bringing the, this is a shield being held by a Triton. And so perhaps we're talking about uh, the armor of Achilles, uh, the Cupid and the position of these sort of Nereid women on the backs of these animals certainly brings up Aphrodite references, but maybe also it's not too much of a stretch. These are all things Janie has done a really good job of arguing. It's not too much of a stretch to have this winged sort of uh, Cupid-like figure on the back of the dolphin be a, 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 a reference to Palaimon Melikertes. It would appear that what's happened is, is that this mosaic has provided, uh, you know, the audience of the bath in the second century with a, with a wide variety of sort of uh, uh, interpretive possibilities. You could sort of sit in that room and let your mind run wild and think about you know, the, the sponsor and associations with Poseidon, associations with Palaimon Melikertes, associations with Aphrodite and Corinth and, and different things like that. Uh, so lots and lots of sort of fun ways to read that mosaic floor. The starting line on the, on, on the early stadium appears to have been abandoned uh, very, very soon after it was built. It did not work well. Uh, <laughs> You can go to the site, it's been reconstructed. The strings stick on the bronze tacks in the ground uh, and uh, none of the starting gates fall at the same time. Uh, and so uh, my guess is it, it, it was a well-conceived uh, idea that, that uh, didn't go so well in execution. Uh, almost uh, immediately after the thing was built, it was abandoned in favor of a single string that's at two ends that goes down uniformly uh, across all of the runners. And so that's, that's the one that's used. For example, Kim could tell you, 
Uh, that's the one that's used uh, uh, famously at Nemea. You can still go see that when you see the reenactment of the Nemean games. Um, there are two final questions in the Q&A, if you don't mind, and I think that we can probably close out where you've been very generous. Sure, with sure. Time, there's one from Cody and one uh, from uh, Serge. So, so the Cody asks if the Byzantine fortress has been excavated to much extent or has the focus of the site throughout the years uh, always been on prior occupation phases? No, actually, in fact, uh, uh, significant the parts that are dark here in this picture, the Northeast Gate, Tower 2, and the Tower 15 and 14 areas have been extensively excavated. Um, and all of that information was largely processed by Timothy Gregory in his monograph on the Hexamillion and Fortress, uh, but there still remain lots and lots of things that he wasn't able to talk about uh, in the context of that publication that I think are, are really fascinating. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to Nick Cardulius, who in the 1980s did a surface survey of the fortress and published that himself. Uh, and so there's still a lot of that information to process and really kind of think through as well especially in the context of the sort of larger Eastern Corinthia archaeological survey as well. So um, there's a question about what is the future of the site? Is there a museum already? Yes, there's actually a museum that would be in this location right here on this map. It was built in the 1970s uh, and Betsy Gebhardt has just done a phenomenal job of, of keeping that museum in, in great shape. It was just recently uh, uh, renovated and cleaned up again. Uh, the, the displays are quite informative. It's, it's a really, really great place to, to visit. Um, so yeah, uh, plans for the future are basically to keep working through these old records. Uh, we're committed to the idea that we, that we shouldn't be engaging in any more extensive excavation until we've shared with uh, everyone who's willing to read uh, or, or willing to listen, you know, what happened in the 1960s through 1980s at the dig. Well, on behalf of the Central Missouri Society of the AIA, we really are appreciative of this wonderful talk that you gave, and it was just wonderful to hear all of your work. And, um, you know, we wish that we could have hosted you in person because we do like to do that well, but these are the days that we live in with COVID. So maybe some point in the future that that can be done. As a final reminder um, to the rest of the society members, we will have um, our Joukowsky talk um, on, on April 6th. And so you will be getting notifications on registration